my name is Kirsten Rice, and I am the MTSS coordinator here at Kent ISD. So um, what that means is I coordinate our, uh, a project where we partner with districts um, as a whole to implement MTSS for both behavior and reading, um, K-12. And so one of the focuses, we are partnered with um, my Blissey at the state level. They are our technical support to do that. And um, last year, they actually brought the author of this book into their state conference. Um, and so we were able to see him for a really short like period of time. And, um, and it was... It, it was kind of like mind-blowing and just like, it, I mean, he was kind of speaking in the choir, speaking to me, but um, at the same time, it was like we wanted more. And so last week, actually, we were able to bring him in. How many, I know some people were here and were able to see him speak, so how, like, let me just get a, okay, great. So I knew that um, we were hoping there were some glitches with LCN registration. We were hoping that everybody that signed up for this session would be able to be there and see him in person. Um, uh, but it's going to be just fine. Um, I find that listening to him speak makes the book a little bit easier for me to understand. Hopefully, because I've seen him and had the chance to pick his brain, I'll be able to make it easier for you to understand as well. And it's not like it's a super complex read. Um, but how many of you are elementary focused? Almost everybody. Secondary? All right. So um, that's good. Um, and just so you know, though, if you are upper elementary, it, it, when we go through the process of, of this book, it does appear like it's talking a lot about foundational skills, and it is. Um, but all of the research that um, he's reviewed and looked at in this book is really speaks to the fact that there's no statute of limitations. He says it several times on these findings, and that even um, when we apply these findings in this research to older students, they make progress even faster than younger students. So, um, so it is. So for those of you that have even a K-5 or beyond focus, um, it's it is more again like an intervention piece then, but um, instead of a prevention, but. Um, still very, very applicable. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and um, get started. So are, how many of you have read pieces or parts of this book already? Okay, <laughs> some people, all right, good. So um, today I, I had actually planned on kind of going through chapters one through three, but given that we just got the books today, that's not going to happen. So um, so I am going to operate this session as a, as a true book study. Um, and starting next time, we'll have at least um, the expectation would be that you would have read and reviewed um, the first four chapters of the book, and we'll actually dig in and, and as a group start to process that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So today, um, I'm really going to just set the stage for you with this book. Um, and so our purpose for this session is really to talk about um, what the scientific research is behind reading instructions. So behind how kids learn to read and how that impacts our instruction. Um, so um, I'll let you, can you, let me turn off this. I'll let you guys read. This is an excerpt from the preface of the book and I'll let you guys read that to yourselves quickly. So um, what the first portion of the book really does talk about is the fact that there is a uh, disconnect between what happens in our classrooms on a daily basis and what the science behind reading research tells us. Um, and so with that, we'll jump into our inclusion activity around this question. Do our current practices reflect the most current research and do we have results to prove it? So I'm going to have you um, engage in this activity. So the protocol 
is to just take two minutes individually, jot down your thoughts about that focus question, and then when prompted, we'll get up and we'll find an eye contact partner. Um, partner A will share their thoughts, partner B will paraphrase when finished, and then add on to the thinking, and then switch roles and repeat. Okay? So thinking about our current practices and what you know about the most current, um, most current research, um, what do our, do our current practices reflect that, and do we have the results to prove it? So go ahead and take two minutes to just think silently about that. And then when prompt, I'll give you a prompt to stand up and find a, a partner. I almost felt bad like ending that conversation because people were really, <laughs> really engaged. Um, but is anybody comfortable sharing out whole group what some of the things that they talked about with their partner or partners? Yeah. Um, it was interesting perspective and because she's secondary. She said a lot of the kids that are coming in and if they're identified as special ed, then they get support, but the others don't, and many of them are not reading at grade level, so they can't get full access to the content. And what is their development? Uh, answer 504, the 504 simply, like you yeah. pointed out, simply says, and longer time on tests, that's not helping them learn how to read. Mm. Okay. Longer time on tests, is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that's the accommodation. Um, yeah, I think it's it's really going to be interesting to have that secondary perspective because um, just knowing what um, their perspective on the kids that are coming to their them too and the, the skills that are there. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, so um, that's actually a great kind of segue into the, the next um, article that we're going to dig into to kind of set the stage, but you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Um, Buy-in, there's a great divide out there um, between research and, and the practice and, and what current practices are that might not be related to the research. Um, people are very emotionally attached to that. It's, it's what they've learned, it's what they've been doing for a long time, and it's honestly it's not their fault. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't know any teacher who doesn't want their kids to learn to read, right? Everybody wants their kids to learn to read, but right now that's not happening um, at the rate that we would really like it to be and, and the way that it, as according to the research, it could be. Um, so that's a, a really great, great point, too. Yeah. As I walked around, I heard a common theme of um, teachers really having a lot of control of what was what they were teaching in their own classrooms, mm -hmm. and that maybe not being um, aligned or on the same scope and sequence as their partner teachers mm -hmm. too. So I hear I see he heads nodding. <laughs> um, so I heard that as well too, and, and that leading to some struggles with um, intervention groups and pulling kids together and, and ensuring that there's a, a solid foundation um, too. And Again, with MTSS, um, that is one of the, the, the big ideas, right, is that there's a, a solid core, guaranteed viable core um, instruction that happens, whether it's a boxed curriculum or whether it's a scope and sequence that um, everybody adheres to. Um, there's, that's one of the, the key features in, in all of this is that we, we, have to, we have to give kids that in order um, to identify the kids who are really in a, a need of, of intervention. And, yep. We also talked about in our group how, um, you know, like some places, well, that's free, so try that one. And that's free, so try that one. So it's yeah. not, yeah. It's not that, necessarily, it's more about, oh, yeah. well, we can afford that, so yeah. that one. Yeah, it, so uh, such a legitimate concern, right? There's. Um, yeah, we're strapped for cash. <laughs> and um, yeah, and sometimes it does come down to that. Do we have the resources to actually implement um, the research? And, you know, what's the, there's some pros and cons to that. But yeah, there's some great free stuff out there. But 
we have to be able then to, to actually compare it to mm -hmm. um, the research to be able to say that it's, it's a good, good fit. Hang on. All right, so thank you for engaging in that activity. Um, so our outcomes, and these are really the outcomes for the entire session, not for the entire four sessions that we come together, not just today, um, that by the end of these four sessions, we should be able to articulate um, findings from research about how students learn to read. Um, we should be able to use that research to understand how to assess students with reading difficulties. And um, we should be able to apply the research to core instruction for all students and then uh, tiered interventions for struggling readers. So it really is, as the title says, assessing, um, preventing, and overcoming reading difficulties. So today's agenda, um, we're going to spend most of our time today in this article, Hard Words, Why Kids Aren't Being Taught to Read. This was, um, this came out just a couple of weeks ago. and so. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll spend a little bit of time um, looking at the IES practice guides, and then we'll talk about what um, day two will look like. So um, I saw that I had a couple people already um, register for class um, or for this, this session. Um, so I'm going to ask you if you have a computer with you to go in um, to Google really quickly right now and sign in and then go to your classroom account. This is our class code. So you'll be, um, you'll be able to access um, all of our resources there. I already did, like I posted a link to the article that we'll be reviewing. I posted a link to the IES practice guides as well. Um, so take, we'll just take a few minutes right now to get people into Google Classroom so they can see. Um, I'm going to write our class code over on the board so I can just kind of show you what the classroom looks like. Um, I will show you quickly just kind of, so when you log in, um, now this is my view, so I, it's going to be a little bit different, but um, the PowerPoint from today is right there. So if you wanted to follow along there, you could. Um, this is the, this is a, um, which I'll talk about later, but this is the assignment. Don't feel like you have like, uh, an, I mean, true assignment. Last year, um, for every class we were asking people to, or for every session, we were asking people to document things from every session. That's not the case this time. I'm sure they talked about that um, in there. So this is really just a resource for you to use as you're reading if you, um, if you choose and if it's helpful to you. Um, but then I have um, the other two links from that we'll talk about today are there as well. So if you don't want to go in and go through the PowerPoint, the links to the two resources that we'll talk about today, the um, IES practice guides, and then this um, article and podcast are there. Um, so if you're if you want to go there, um, that is all there for you. But with that, so it seems like, for the most part, barring some district level um, issues and then just internet issues, <laughs> um, in general, most people were able to get there and just so that they, it's, it's really just there for you to be able to access the resources. Um, so this um, next article that we're gonna spend most of our time today in was um, it, it literally just came out September 10th. And um, I, I can't even remember how I got wind of it. I think I saw somebody like posted it on Facebook. And um, I started reading it. And I was like, oh, this is like, it's a great summary of kind of why this book becomes so important. So it really does do a good job of setting the stage. Has anybody seen this article yet or the, listened to the podcast? Awesome, <laughs> because then I'm not being redundant. So, um, um, so it's it's I, what I did was, and it's not pretty because I couldn't I, I couldn't get it to print from the online. I turned it into a PDF, but all the information is there. Um, so it, there's an article that you have, and if you don't have it in front of you, I'll get it. I have it up here, and I'll get it to you in just a second. Um, some of the graphs didn't come out because they're interactive online, so there's some of the graphs look blank, but the information is all still there. 
And I thought about doing a jigsaw with this article, but then it was like, it, it would be really hard, I think, to understand and pick up the pieces. So, um, so we are gonna dig into the whole article today. It's not terrifyingly long by any means, um, but it really is chock full of good information and it really spells it out um, in a more interesting way and, and uh, better than I could just spewing information at you up here. Um, it also has a podcast, so when you, if you were to pull it up online, there's a link to a podcast that um, is it's about an hour long, um, and it just it kind of goes over everything in the article. Plus, like you actually get to hear the interviews that they describe in the um, in the article, and it in it little it the, there's a few more examples in the podcast as well too. So I do highly recommend listening to that. I I listened to it in my car while I was driving back and forth to places and. Um, it was just really, um, really powerful. And what I like the most about this article is it takes, I feel like we're in a society right now where teachers are blamed a lot for a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it clearly takes the blame off teachers, right? It's not, it, it's not anybody's fault. Like we said, every teacher wants their kids to, to learn to read. And um, so now we're just kind of looking at why and, and how. So um, <clears throat> this activity is going to take a good chunk of time. And while you guys start this activity, I will go down and get the rest of the extra books, too. Um, so I'm thinking just in your table groups um, rather than three or four. We're going um, to we're going to engage in that say something strategy, which is usually a, a partner, um, you know, A and B strategy. But um, <clears throat> we'll just kind of number off in our groups and as a team agree to read a certain section of the article. Partner one will be the first one to kind of, after you've read it, everybody's read it, to summarize it, and then everybody else can add to the thinking or add feedback, agree to the next section. Um, and then partner two will be the first person to you know, share their thinking and everybody else then can add to. And then next would be partner three, next section, partner four, however many sections you decide to chunk it up as, as a group. Do you have questions about that? All right. So um, what did you guys think? Any comments for the good of the group? I heard a lot of really great dialogue. Yeah. I like how the conversation went back to um, it, we would be empowered more if we had more college professors and administrators actually dig into the science with us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, right? Because that's, that's where the decisions are getting made is on the administrative side. And then, you know, the, the training happens initially at the college level. Yeah. Anything else? I think one of the things we share, too, is that it's, it's not just a teacher problem. It's, it has to be, there has to, and I agree, there has to be buy-in on every level, mm -hmm. at our administrator's level, at the central office level, and it just can't be like our intervention problem. It's, oh, you yeah. know, we, in most schools, it's not just ours too, we have very minimal title services, you know, mm -hmm. this small select group of kids. Now, we still have struggling readers in our class that aren't getting that extra help, mm -hmm. but what do we do? But it has to be a whole buy-in. Mm -hmm. It just can't be mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And, and that's, what, that's why when I kind of introduced it, you know, I, I said teachers get blamed for a lot, and this really does kind of take the blame right off, off the teachers. So it's, it's nice. And so it's, it's nice to share then with others right back at the ranch, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we talked about how everyone is kind of doing phonics different in their own way. Mm -hmm. We have like a guided reading program and stuff that we use, but everyone is kind of doing whatever for phonics and not on the same page. Mm -hmm. So we were just found that interesting in the article too, of, you know, finding phonics you know, right to be taught. Yeah. So, you know, speaking about the, the, the connection between, like, you know, college and administrators, everybody's talking about guaranteed and viable curriculum, guaranteed and viable curriculum. Well, 
you're not providing that, right? So teachers are really, you know, and I know as a parent, um, you know, what my kids get, they've had different teachers. Um, I have one in fourth grade now and one in first grade. And so they've had different teachers both years for kindergarten and first grade. So my older son had a different kindergarten teacher and a different first grade teacher than my younger son. It looks totally different, you know, what, what's coming home. And it's not, I mean, it's only a couple years apart. And those teachers were both there and part of that grade level team when my older son was, was in that grade too. So um, it does become, um, yeah, like the, how are we guaranteeing that everybody's getting the same thing? I um, also talked with a reading interventionist who said, I can tell what classroom these, who their teacher was in first grade. Yeah, <laughs> everyone's like, yep. Based on the language they're using or the skills that they have when they come in. So there's not a consistency um, across grade levels, but then even throughout the grade levels vertically either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so as an aside, I mentioned to this table too, um, so they drew out what does Kilpatrick say about this article? So Kilpatrick's the author of our, of our book. What does he say about this article? And, um, and I, not oddly enough, but fortunately enough, um, after he was here that day for the, the day-long presentation, I got to take him out to dinner with another um, literacy consultant. And it was like, I'm a total dork, but I told them, it was like the best night of my life since my wedding. Like, it was so amazing. Um, and he, and, and he, we were like, I was like, oh, at first he was, you could just tell he was really tired. And because he had done a whole day, and then he'd come back for West Michigan Literacy Council and like packed everything into like an hour and 15 minutes, too. Um, and you could just tell he was so tired by the end. And I was like, I feel really bad, like dragging him out to dinner. But you know what? He's got to eat. And his wife was with him, and she was super sweet, and she like wanted to go and, and talk to people. So <laughs> we went out to dinner, and um, but once he he like got a second wind, and we were out for three and a half hours wow. because he did not stop talking. Like he was just he kept like just filling us with information. Um, but one of the things that he said was, "Hey, have you guys seen that hard words article?" And we were like, "Yes!" And he's like, "Wasn't it fantastic?" And we were like, "Yes!" Um, but he said that. So he, the, he, very new to him, like this fame that he's all of a sudden gotten. Mm-hmm. Until two years ago, he was still working in a school two days a week as a psychologist and teaching um, at the college. But so, so imagine now all of a sudden he's getting these calls to travel. I mean, last weekend he was in Saskatoon. So like he, he left us on Wednesday, went back to Syracuse to teach a class on Thursday and flew to Saskatoon on Friday. So he's like... He's like, I, like it, it's just he was having a really hard time managing his schedule. And so the author of this article had actually emailed him over six months ago and tried to connect with him as part of um, <laughs> as part of his um, as part of her research in which she was writing the article. And he ignored her because he just couldn't keep everything back together. So he um, he couldn't keep it all um everything organized and so he never never responded to her and his comment was I'm really glad I didn't because now Louisa Moltz is the bad cop (laughs) and I can just come in and support her in a really nice way so um, so he so it was completely aligned with his thinking and the thinking of the book which kind of made me want to share it even more um, here today so any other thoughts while you were engaged in that conversation Good read, yeah. It definitely causes people to feel discomfort. Yeah. Because of things that they've learned and things that it and it doesn't mean that what we've mm-hmm. always done was bad. No. Because there are there are some great pieces because we all know that the bottom line is we want kids to understand yeah. what they do. Yes. And so yeah, some kids need more of that word. Mm-hmm. With words mm-hmm. to really truly be able to decode. Mm-hmm. Especially <coughs> Kids that come from impoverished areas, sure. they don't have sure. language. Mm-hmm. They don't come to school mm-hmm. with thousands of words. Right, right. Yeah, and um, I think that what I liked 
most about this article because it, it does. I mean, certainly in the beginning, it's like I mean, it's attacking balanced literacy. And when I say balanced literacy, a lot of people say balanced literacy, and um, I think they have a different meaning for it than the balanced literacy yeah. capital B capital L, right? So, like for example, there's a balanced literacy session this afternoon, and I was like, ooh, is that going to cause some dissonance, right? Um, so. So, um, but in, in talking through that, um, it's, it's more a balanced approach to literacy, right? Where they kind of outline that in the end, right? You, you can't just do phonics and ignore everything else. But it's just the way that we approach it, right? That's what our read-alouds are for. That's what our, you know, and we, we do that in a different way. We don't throw the read-aloud book at the kid and say, read this and tell me what it means, right? Um, they have to have the, the phonics first. So, um, so it's a, right, so a lot of people say balanced literacy and they're really talking more about a balanced approach to, to literacy. Um, and so that I always kind of want to clarify that as well. Um, but yeah, I think that it does cause some discomfort. And what I like best about that at the end is where it does call out, mm -hmm. like, yes, there are some things, you know. And I mean, hey, when you look at all the studies, like very little of what we do with kids is harmful to kids you know there are good portions of everything but we just got to take the best and and put it all together all you can do is the best you can with what you have where you are. So when I read the other quote in here, and you know better, we do better. To get over that guilt or that feeling, mm -hmm. I wish I could go back in time. We can only go forward. So yeah. we add and perfect what we do. There are there are so many things, right, that like I thought that was the best thing to do at the time, and then all of a sudden, like, oh gosh, <laughs> probably not, you know. And so that's exactly it. You just gotta take where you are now and move forward. And it wasn't bad. Yeah, right. So when we know better, we do better. Yeah. Okay. We won't spend a lot of time here because we only have about um, 15 minutes left. Um, but I did want to, there is a link um, either in the Google Classroom or if you're on the slides, you can link right to this by the slide or I created a bit.ly for it too. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of show the alignment um, between what we were reading about and then the most recent IES practice guides that were released. Um, these are from 2016. Um, so you can see the recommendations for um, foundational skills. And I love that they say to support reading for understanding or reading for meaning, right? Because a lot of times we think about phonics and People are like, no, we need to read for meaning. And absolutely, we need to read for understanding and for comprehension. And that's the, that's the end goal. But all the pieces need to be there. So um, if you know a little bit about um, the uh, IES practice guides and how they're set up, they come up with recommendations. And then they assign an evidence level to them. Um, and so because it says minimal evidence, does not mean it's not effective. It just means there were fewer studies that actually met the strict criteria that, so IES is the Institute for Educational Sciences, and they have some really strict criteria that they look at for research. So it doesn't mean it wasn't effective. It just means that there weren't as many studies to prove it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so you really have to take, take that into consideration. So the first one is teaching academic language skills, including the use of inferential and narrative language and vocabulary knowledge. The second one, develop awareness of the segments of sounds in speech and how they link to letters. So phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, um, where there's been lots of studies, right, to say that that is um, effective. The third one, teach students to decode words, analyze word parts, and write and recognize words. Again, a whole bunch of studies, lots of evidence um, to support that. And then ensure that each student reads connected text every day to support reading accuracy, fluency, and comprehension, right? And moderate evidence, but the evidence is, you know, the studies were good, it's just there weren't a lot of them. Um, so just really quickly, just four, four or five minutes or so um, with a partner, 
how do those IES practice guide, um, how does that support the ideas in the article that we just um, analyzed? And then are there areas of potential conflict between the recommendations and the article? So I'll put the recommendations actually back up there and allow you guys to talk about the connections and potential conflicts, if any.